Hello, um, I hope you are all back from your refreshment breaks um, and uh, we're ready to start with the second breakout session for the afternoon block. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Silla Sepp. I serve as the Director of Operations at MyData Global and uh, I will be your host uh, for, for this session. Um, in the next 15 minutes, uh, we will hear two short uh, presentations giving you some food for thought, uh, but also concrete examples on how collective governance of data can be realized in practice. Um, and after that, uh, we have some, also some time uh, to, uh, reserved for, for discussion to, together with all of the, the speakers. Um, and so, as in the previous sessions throughout the day, do use the chat uh, to, to share any of your um, own insights, questions, um, and also upvote um, the, the questions so that uh, we can see which uh, should be prioritized and, and really brought to the stage uh, to elaborate together with the uh, speakers. Um, before welcoming our excellent speakers on stage, uh, let me also set the scene for the upcoming uh, presentations and uh, discussions. Um, the cornerstone of the My Data philosophy is the idea that uh, individuals should be in a position to know uh, and control their personal data, as well as gain personal insights and benefit from it. Um, and yet, as we have also learned over the years, uh, there, are, there are contexts and information that include um, also a collective dimension to it, uh, meaning that individuals' uh, data may often contain also information about uh, others. And then it raises questions of how and what could be even controlled individually versus collectively. Um, and this is not an only, only an issue of uh, controlling specific data, but also about meaningful forms of, uh, for example, negotiating power. Um, so with that, I'm really glad to have uh, uh, those experts joining us today uh, who have uh, looked at these questions uh, quite closely in the, in the past years. Um, so let's give a round of uh, our virtual applause uh, using the, even the emojis below uh, to our first speakers of, of the session, uh, Matthew Pruitt and Jack Henderson from uh, Radical Exchange Foundation. And uh, Matt has shared with us uh, that uh, his uh, work focuses on evolving the basic institutions in democracy and markets and, and also experimenting with new ways of sharing power through voting and property for democracy to survive and, and thrive. Um, and I know that they've done some great work um, uh, together with Jack on new institutions called um, Data Coalitions, uh, which I hope to hear more about uh, during the session. So please, Matt and Jack, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really glad to be uh, connecting with the My Data community. And um, uh, and yeah, uh, uh, so my name is Matt Prum, president of uh, Radical Exchange Foundation, and I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Jack Henderson. So I, I will um, I will jump in and give a give a quick um, flavor of the work that we've done on uh, shared governance of data. Um, uh, I will set up some of the motivations and, uh, and Jack will talk a little bit more about it and looking forward to getting into uh, further discussion. So um, in essence, the, the work that Radical Exchange has done uh, concerning data over the past several years um, is, is motivated by the, the idea that um, all, you know, all data pertains to multiple people and, uh, and, and therefore, any sort of disclosure of data, any sort of sharing or use of data has, uh, has externalities, which, are, which can be positive or negative, and are in principle uh, very, very difficult to manage. I mean, whenever data moves, it essentially changes the, it, it reconfigures the balance of power in the relationships between, between individuals, and, um, uh, and is therefore uh, difficult to deal with on, an, uh, on a strictly individualistic uh, basis, which is why we're interested in basically in, um, in, in in mapping out institutions of shared governance and um, articulating how uh, regulation and technology can kind of play into inst uh, um, the creation of institutions of shared data governance. Uh, so, um, Jack, yeah, great, thank you. Uh, so the um, so just to just to sort of get, give a, a quick example of why this is so important. Um, if you imagine an individual making a transaction for information with a third party, such as uh, 23andMe, you might imagine an individual uh, sharing, uh, sharing their genetic data 
with, with a company like 23andMe in exchange for analysis of that data, which tells them about their, about their ancestry and they may find it interesting or useful in that sense. So it might be, so this might be essentially a positive externality uh, interaction between the, the transaction between the two parties. Um, but then if we kind of move our, our circle of, of focus out a little bit and we imagine the uh, consequences of this transaction on a, on a wider circle of people, the same transaction might be sort of a, a, a net negative socially um, if, if we can consider the interests of, uh, let's say, the individual's family members who might be interested in, um, in hiding their ancestry or, 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 make, or not making it easy for, for third parties to understand um, uh, information about them. Then if we zoom out our circle of concern a little bit farther, we might see that this kind of sharing of information um, allows for really socially useful analysis of, um, uh, of, of, of diseases that are correlated with, uh, with genetics, and it might help the advancement of some uh, of, of, of medical work that enables a larger circle of people to, uh, you know, to, to receive better, uh, better medical care and get diseases diagnosed. Uh, so then, it, you know, looking at, at that level of granularity, it's a social, it's a net positive socially. Then if we zoom out further, we might see that this same individual transaction is bad uh, socially for uh, people who are vulnerable to similar genetic diseases, but then may get discriminated against by uh, insurance companies or, or, or others who, who use that, that data um, against them. And so you can sort of see, um, or Jack, can you go back one slide um, a moment here, or that doesn't is that not, is it possible to go back one slide? Oh yeah, perfect, thanks. So then here, um, oh, sorry, forward one, my bad. So here, so here you can see that basically the, that those sort of lines between the individual and 23andMe are sort of just that individual transaction is cutting across all these layers of, of, of externalities that are impacting a, a broader circle of people. So what we're, what we're interested in doing um, if you uh, forward one, please. What we're interested in doing basically is coming up with institutions that are able to take account of all of the of of these you know this more more complex set of disclosure externalities and sort of bundling them into a common interest and enabling that that larger set of uh, of people to make uh, a shared decision about how their information is used. So that, um, so that the problem of externalities is essentially simplified from the point of view of the, of the state or the, regulator, or, the, or the regulator who needs to manage the, uh, the, manage the market or regulate the market. So in other words, if, the, if, if we're able to bundle all these complex normative concerns into larger groups of people and then have the state regulating those larger groups and how they're using data instead of regulating how individuals are using data, the, you know, the immensely complex problem that faces a state or a regulator is, uh, is, is simplified and it becomes more possible to imagine a state articulating a, um, a, a regulatory scheme that could, um, that could grapple with the, with the, you know, the complex externalities on, on the market. Um, so what we've done uh, over the past few years is uh, is develop a, a a regulatory vision, basically, that sort of points towards this vision as as a as a points towards this idea as a north star. Points towards the idea of of coalitions of people um, who've who've banded their data interests together, becoming the sort of regulated um, actor. In the in the data marketplace, instead of the uh, of the individual, and so and what in in the in the work that we've that we've done, which is you know goes into much more detail than it, I can uh, articulate um, here, we're we're thinking about these these coalitions as basically a new kind of regulatory of of regulated entity. What that would have to essentially be be independent. It couldn't be owned by other sorts of profit-making businesses that would have a whole range of, um, of rules that would apply to them to ensure that they are uh, genuinely sort of representative of the interests of, of members who are entrusting their information to them. Um, and, um, a, a, and importantly also that the, um, uh, importantly also we, you know, 
this kind of regulatory scheme would need to take account of the externalities between the coalitions. So in other words, in the same way that, you know, individual disclosures of information have uh, positive or negative externalities on other individuals, the same would be true with coalitions that are bundling people's interests in this way. And so it's therefore necessary to think about a overarching regulatory scheme that uh, takes account of that and enables coalitions to um, to talk to each other and come to uh, come to arrangements or make claims against e against each other if one of them is, um, is 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 disclosing information or refraining from disclosing information in a way that um, uh, that has serious impacts on the on other coalitions and their members. Um, so I'll turn it over to Jack to talk a little bit more a um, little bit more about this and about how. Um, uh, uh, different sorts of new technological affordances play into this. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so as Matt was hinting at, there are really important questions that we've begun to ask beyond regulation, basically. And, and one category is is governance. Um, so, uh, you know, individuals will just need to make some personal decisions, such as uh, which coalitions to join. And, and that's because um, coalitions will have different value propositions, basically. So the choice of joining one can come to be thought of as an, kind of an expression of a person's values. Uh, and in fact, we imagine individuals choosing many coalitions as, as partial or, or plural stewards of their data, and not just across data spaces, but also across public, private, and social sectors, uh, which can basically check each other with different incentives and policies for sharing data. Uh, that said, within coalitions, most decisions will need to be collective and, and co-determined for the reasons Matt gave around uh, bundling externalities. Um, and fortunately, there are many democratic innovations, which we spend much of our work on at Radical Exchange, that data coalitions can begin to deploy. Uh, we're especially interested in um, the use of mini publics and citizens assemblies, um, online deliberation aids like Polis, uh, and decision tools like uh, quadratic voting. Um, so it would be great if we could learn how to do democracy um, for data coalitions, but even if a coalition were to make a, a deeply democratic decision um, to disclose their data, the, the coalition still has no choice but to give wholesale access to a total copy of their data. And as a result, they lose all control of any downstream uses from third parties. Um, but again, fortunately, there are um, there's kind of an evolving suite of technologies that coalitions can begin to use to control what data uh, is revealed and to whom it's revealed and, and how it's revealed. So briefly, we're excited about um, privacy enhancing technologies, other cryptographic tools like zero knowledge, designated verifier proofs, um, as well as new architectures like data stations. Um, and lastly, in, in terms of incentives, as Matt was kind of getting at, um, you know, pe people often think about like business models here, but if, if coalitions were to just try to maximize profit, then there are going to be clear um, kind of principal agent issues between um, basically the, the coalitions and the members who are assigning their data interests to them. Um, instead, we want coalitions to have more civic obligations and fiduciary duties. And so, you know, part of that is making sure that there are rules in place. So, you know, coalitions have to, for instance, share whatever profit they make with their members and so forth. Um, and even more crucially, it's, it's really about um, putting these coalitions in kind of positions of, of power over and above uh, private corporate actors. And both regulation and technology can help with that. So the Data Freedom Act is, is in this direction, envisioning coalitions as a special kind of fiduciary that sits above corporate actors, giving those actors who, who might want to access data really no choice but to work with coalitions uh, and thus be held accountable by them. Um, and at the same time, privacy enhancing technologies are also likely to create many, many new data spaces, um, arguably much better ones, actually, um, which presents an opportunity as well uh, for coalitions to move into those spaces first and establish democratic governance. Um, hence, we'd love to see um, civic-oriented uh, entities such as what we imagine for data coalitions um, to you know, begin earnestly experimenting with 
and learning to harness uh, privacy enhancing technologies. And yeah, so the work now is really about just progressing on all of these fronts and um, making sure that we're tying all this important work together, um, which is why it's uh, such a pleasure to be here today and, and to learn from all of you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you both uh, Matt and, uh, and Jack for this uh, great presentation and also introducing the, um, the, the concept of the data coalitions and, um, and I mentioned concept um, here, but um, also do you know already any practical examples of, of data coalitions that uh, exist uh, to, today? So the, the um, I see in the, in the comments, one of the, one of the questions is, isn't it, uh, isn't it necessary that it's like a registered uh, organization or, or a cooperative? And my, the, I think the answer to that is that the, we, we were intentionally using an, uh, a different word here, you know, when we talk about coalition, um, it is essentially serving the same purpose as like a, as a cooperative or a data trust. It's do, attempting to do the same sort of uh, thing of bundling, bundling interests together. Um, but we think basically that these kinds of entities need to be um, uh, need to be thought of as a new class of entity and 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 regulated as such. So there aren't any examples of what we would really consider a data coalition as we're trying to lay out this vision because there aren't any legal frameworks in the world that um, that. It, it embrace all the different parts of the of the vision that we're trying to lay out here. So this is kind of an attempt to uh, to create a template or a north star for um, for for lawmakers to think about the um, the regulatory and legal scaffolding that could support data co data cooperatives and trusts and other kinds of um, you know collectivizing data entities to um, to um, uh, uh, um, advocate for, for people's interests in, in the best possible way. Thanks. Um, there was also a question of you already identified different kinds of relations between uh, different kinds of coalitions then. Yeah, so, and, and Jack, feel free to jump in on, on, on any of these questions, um, as I know you've thought about them as much or more um, than I have. But I, uh, in terms of the uh, relations between different kinds of coalitions, I think the short answer here is that, um, that the, um, the, the relation, we essentially need to develop a whole new kind of like jurisprudence, but, you know, for um, arbitrating um, and adjudicating the different kinds of disputes and conflicts that could arise uh, between between uh, between coalitions. So, for example, if you have one coalition that is very liberally disclosing lots of information that pertains to the interests of people in other coalitions, you might need those other coalitions to be able to make some sort of a claim against the against the first coalition to be able to say to that first to be able to you know essentially go before some sort of administrative court or something like that and say to that first coalition um, either 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 you need to stop sharing information in that way or you need to split the split the the profits that you're earning from sharing your information in that way with our members because it's impacting our members right and um uh, so you can think of sort of injunctive claims or claims for damages or profit sharing as a couple modes by which uh, data coalitions might relate to each other. Um, but there are many more. And I think we can't, it's kind of, a, it's hard even to think of them all in advance. It's necessary just to, um, uh, to point to this as an area of uh, jurisprudence that, uh, that future, future regulators are going to have to, future regulators or administrative judges are going to have to uh, to work through. Thank you. I would just um, add that. that like... is... Yeah, thanks. I would just add briefly that uh, you know I think that's a really essential question because it's essentially going to have to be a balancing act between the fact that you know coalitions we expect them to offer different value propositions. You know, some may be more privacy focused, others may focus on 
um, you know, getting fair compensation. Others may focus on, you know, specific kinds of data uses and, and so forth. And those are just a few examples. And people should be able to opt in and out of different, um, you know, value propositions and, and different data coalitions. But at the same time, we, we still have to grapple with these disclosure externalities. And, and um, that's where this kind of new need for jurisprudence comes in. Um, basically, the balance between um, people, you know, having agency over what their data is used for and, and how they can control it while also, you know, re you know, reconciling the fact that data is so relational and there are tremendous, um, you know, externalities from withholding or disclosing it that um, it's, it's a tricky balance. Thank you. Um, and as I can see, this is very much a, um, um, an agenda of, that pushes boundaries and like limits um, and uh, needs uh, then really experimenting that you're already doing. So uh, it's also very uh, inspiring uh, that, uh, that you're doing uh, all of this work. Um, Thank you. Um, I'll um, now let the audience uh, to, to digest a little bit around the, the topic of uh, data coalitions and uh, the broader context of, of that. Um, and welcome on stage our, our second uh, or, or third uh, speaker, uh, Paul Oliver De Hay, uh, who is the CEO of um, Hestia.ai, uh, a company focused on building sustainable data ecosystems. Uh, you may have already seen Paul Oliver um, also speaking earlier uh, today in one of the other sessions. Um, Paul Lerio has been previously the director of the nonprofit Personal Data that I owe and the board member of uh, My Data Global. Uh, and he was also closely involved in the uncovering of the Cambridge Analytica scandal a few years ago. Um, today we will hear about the, the various cross domain efforts and tools that support uh, collective advocacy on personal data empowerment. Um, Paul Lerio, there, the stage is yours. Thank you, Silly. Um, and thank you for uh, the Radical Exchange guys, uh, Matt and Jack, because um, that's a very, uh, very closely related topic, actually. Um, you will hear that instead of the word coalition, we use the word collective for actually the same reasons, the, the absence of a proper regulatory framework and the fact that we want to avoid using um, existing language because it just doesn't quite fit. Um, so today I want to talk indeed about building uh, shared momentum towards empowerment. Uh, I'm the CEO of STI.ai, and what I will present is a project called DigiPower Academy, but also a whole constellation of other projects around that. Um, but I just didn't want my first slide to be overwhelming with logos. So let me, let me uh, explain a little bit more uh, of what we do. So this morning I presented uh, in a very short pitch uh, how DigiPower Academy helps people recover, understand, and leverage their personal data. So I presented quickly, and I will reiterate somewhat here, the fact that um, in DigiPower Academy, you can get your Google data back, your, your Google semantic location history data back, so you can understand better how Google is using this data to locate you around the world, how it's using Wi-Fi signals, how it's trying to make sense of your movement patterns. Similarly, in DigiPower Academy, you can use your Twitter data to better understand how um, Twitter is trying to place you in some kind of semantic space and trying to, um, trying to target you with ads, try to make your attention available um, in exchange for cash, of course, to advertisers so they can target you with different messages. In DigiPower Academy, you can also look at um, exports, data exports from uh, dating applications, compare your profile, your usage of the data across different apps, different dating apps, um, and so on. So those are like the, the this is I'm describing this slide from the bottom up with the, the effort of understanding your data through visualizations built client side on top of your own data. But there is also arrows here because those arrows tend to those collectives or different projects that we're building with sometimes cooperatives, with sometimes organizations who work in the public interest. So let me describe a little bit more here. Um, one of the collectives that we're contributing to building that we call the eyeballs is focused on the attention economy, is focused on understanding how our attention is leveraged, how um, different actors try to monetize it, and of course, what are the consequences in terms of incentives 
for spreading disinformation, misinformation, these types of questions. So that's the eyeballs. Dating privacy is a collective that is interested in understanding matching algorithms, how they work in the context of dating apps, but very quickly, all of their insights extend to other, other contexts. It might be the context of um, content and recommendation on social networks. So back to the attention economy and the eyeballs, back to the previous collective. But it can also be matching algorithms in completely different contexts, like gig work, um, where workers get in touch with people who are asking for services. So one example is Uber, where we also help um, on DigiPower Academy, people analyze their Uber data and try to make sense of how, well, we help workers, we help drivers make sense of how their data is being used to determine what rights they should take, um, what, what rights are offered to them, how much pay they should get, and things like that. So in that case, we work with labor unions, we work with individual drivers, to start to make sense of this data to then better decide what to do with it. We sort of um, hook onto existing, but emerging re even uh, organizational structures to try to expand the range of problems and the range of approaches they use um, to, to, to their own concerns, right? So we try to bring a data component, a data expertise, a data scrutiny, a data um, insight and just openness of thinking onto existing organizations that are more focused on, on work. Now, another type of actor that we're working with is uh, public transportation authorities or regulatory authorities for specific transportation network areas, um, where we're trying to push the narrative that if only they're the beneficiaries of their transportation solutions were more in control of their own data, then they could offer a perspective to those users of managing the data together towards a better mobility. So in a sense, this slide is quite heavy in different concepts, but it's really about helping people at an individual level better understand their data in many different contexts and then try to extend this into a collective dynamic. So if I sp more specifically look at those collectives, so what Jack and Matt I mean, it's pretty similar to what Jack and Matt were calling coalitions. Um, we have dating privacy that's focused on one-to-one, -one, face to face meeting, essentially, and how that gets transferred online through matching algorithms. We have the eyeballs that's focused on matching people with content. We have a digital literacy collective that's very much tied to Digit Power Academy that is focused on data and its relevance. We have the gig work uh, collective uh, or, or efforts, and then we have the mobility efforts. It's really about blending individual and collective interests all over the place, trying to find financial, non-financial value, but at the same time being mindful that financial value is often the, the, the strongest individual motivation. Um, if, you, if you approach individuals telling them, we're going to solve mobility issues in your city, it's never going to work. Um, and, and so you have to do, you do have to find some financial angle into there, also just simply to sustain the activity of that collective, of that coalition, or even the activities of a service provider in that area. And then one, one big concern for us as well, one big angle that is relevant, one big question is whether there is a public actor in charge of, there is an, an actor in charge of the public interest in that domain. So, for instance, if you think of the ecosystem of dating apps, there is no regulator. There is no one that's really in charge. As long as as we're not going into like criminal um, criminal territory, uh, the, the personal boundaries being violated, there is no real regulation of how dating should work. Um, for for content moderation, it's a very hot topic, but it's far from clear that the state should just come in and say this is allowed, this is not allowed, those dynamics are allowed, those are not. In fact most states try to refrain from going too far in that direction, or many states try to refrain from going in that direction. Uh, for gig work, for instance, it's still very, very debated what should be the kind of regulation that is present there. It's not even clear or it's, it's being debated whether this is even like worth of classic work protections. 
um, and so on. But maybe for mobility, that's one of the clearest where there is actually um, an actor in charge of public interests, at least more, more in some continents than others, maybe. And so th this is really a big question that we should ask ourselves, is there a public actor in charge or is there an actor there to defend the public interest? Because beyond, I mean, there are many different layers of questions here. There, is, there, are, there are questions like who gets to draw those orange arrows? Who gets to be sitting at the other side of that, those arrows? Why do the arrows go towards one actor and not the other? What is the form of data that transits on one of those arrows? And then also, even when you have solved all of those problems, is who is making a value proposition to the end user? And all of those are very different propositions, very different questions, and they need not, and they certainly, I think, should not be decided by the same actor. So whatever systems we, we design, we should make sure to distribute as much as possible of this decision power, including with what is maybe the ultimate locus of power um, through protocols, through standardization. Um, and so that's that I think is going to be a big a big topic now is how do we standardize a lot of different actors of the MyData ecosystem to or or similar you know in the neighborhood of that ecosystem to actually ensure a fair a distribution of power because it could very well be that all we're doing is with some kind of rhetoric around redistributing power towards the individual we end up just helping the biggest players thank you silly i'm looking at questions Yes, thank you, Valeria. I took a, a bit of time to uh, come back on back on stage. Um, already kudos to to you uh, and the DG uh, Power Academy uh, in the in the chats. Uh, it seems like a very uh, excellent project and and very needed one. And uh, I, um, I, it's also great that you brought some concrete examples from certain domains of how to even use or put these data collectives into into context. Um, I reflect mm -hmm. back into some of the um, uh, sessions before um, earlier to today, and uh, one of the sessions was for example, indigenous uh, data, uh, where it was also uh, really expressed and emphasized that uh, people um, need also those practical tools, but also at the same time, uh, this uh, awareness raising and literacy um, raising for actually using those uh, tools. So I think like this is a perfect example on, on how to do that um, uh, you know, in practice. Um, you mentioned uh, many aspects of, um, of who decides what and, uh, and um, like um, certain other organizations who might provide, for example, um, oversight or so forth, uh, but uh, talking also about the actual interactions with the people in the collectives. Um, what are your maybe main highlights or, or maybe even surprises from interacting with people, if there are any, um, when how you see change uh, this changing and uh, um, their eyes are using uh, or being part of these data collectives? Well, I, I think what, what is very striking to me is um, like it has happened maybe like 10 times where live I was using our tools and helping an Uber driver drop their data in our tools and suddenly see a completely different picture of their own work. Um, and actually, because we're using open source tools of Uber, this was exactly the picture that an Uber manager would have on their own, on, on the, that driver's work. Suddenly it really expanded the, I mean, literally, you know, it's someone looking at you with big open eyes with a big smile and just suddenly realizing, wow, this is completely different from what I thought of my activity that I'm doing just basically every day. Um, and those are like, any stere many stereotypes you might have about about Uber drivers are probably true, uh, probably false in relation to how they perceive um, algorithms. They are very smart about understanding what kind of power Uber could have over them. So 
the, these big eyes that are open are in relation to that that sudden change of power that they can they can glimpse basically. Um, that's that's one, and then another one is when talking to some public authorities, um, they really see the potential. I mean, some of them don't at all, but some of them do see the potential, and it's just it does come to them as a solution to some of their big concerns that they have right now, which is to play into more and more massive power accumulation by big private corporations. Thank you. Um, before also uh, building on, on that and uh, welcoming also Matt and Jack back on stage, there are a couple of uh, questions still on the, um, uh, to you directly. Um, have you worked also with refugee uh, commun uh, communities uh, as a collective actor? Uh, and if yes, then do you have any insights on that? Um, so I have not, uh, we have not, because it's a very, obviously very sensitive. Um, I do think that implicitly, without their knowledge, a lot of data gets collected that actually gets used um, much later for, uh, for war crime investigations, these types of things. And I do think there is a huge amount of potential, but we don't have, if you want, the shoulder or the, the security on our side to do something as sensitive uh, alone. But we're getting closer to organizations here in Geneva that might actually, that, that I mean, we're seriously getting closer to organizations who are really thinking, how can we, how can they use those techniques to help, um, to help refugees and to help in the, in very sensitive humanitarian contexts. Thanks. Um, and another question, uh, and I hope that I interpret this um, right, uh, is that after uh, having obtained that data, um, can we also parse it uh, to RDF, uh, for for example? Um, and I guess the the we in in the context of then the individuals participating in the data collective. I don't see those questions anywhere, but yeah. <laughs> oh, it's in the Q and A. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, so that's what we were doing initially, actually, RDF, but but um, but we stopped because simply said you know, the technology was not the technology was not good enough in the context where we wanted to do it. I mean, you have to see that sometimes we have to parse like gigabytes within the the browser. Um, that's already a tough proposition when you use technology like SQL. Um, when you use RDF, it gets it, it, it gets more complex. We might revisit that, but at the moment, that's the situation. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we are joined uh, again by, by Matt and, and Jack as well, and uh, we have time also to expand on, on both of your contributions to today. First of all, again, thank you. Um, and I would uh, maybe start by uh, one of the points that I asked um, or mentioned or reflected back already uh, um, with a question to Paul Olivier that uh, um, in individuals and groups need those tools. Um, uh, we all agree that also there is a um, we need to raise awareness, raise data literacy, uh, technology literacy, and all that. Um, and at the same time, it's a question of um, how to ensure that we, it doesn't also become overwhelming uh, and require too much time or effort. Um, or actually, then we just need to uh, collectively also agree or, or uh, accept that this is the, the price that we need to pay in order to actually be able to you know, negotiate more power, get that uh, agency uh, back. Uh, what are your views on uh, on that regard? Uh, maybe um, Jack uh, first. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. It's it's difficult because we obviously want you know coalitions to be um, democratic and accountable to their members, and so so it's a you know people often think oh let's just have complete input and participation on every question. Um, let's have complete, you know, direct democratic control of our data. And that's obviously an admirable um, aspiration, but at the same time, there are, are clear trade-offs with um, just bandwidth and the amount of time and effort that we can expect people to um, put into, to, um, you know, controlling their, their um, data in these new ecosystems. And so it's, it's basically a the difficult question of trying to identify what are the kind of levers that we can put in place um, that are 
are, you know, strong signals of people's preferences. Part of it we, we think is just kind of which coalitions they choose to join is, is one expression. Um, but then, you know, also when they're in a coalition, how can they begin to, um, you know, express um, agency over the decisions of the coalition itself? And so we just want, want to think, you know, carefully and thoughtfully about the, the levers that we can put in place that would be responsive um, and expressive of people's uh, values and, and interests, while also understanding that there are real complexities um, in this space and the, the scale of data collection is so tremendous that, um, you know, information overload and decision fatigue are, re are real issues. So it's, it's basically a balance there as well. Thank you. I see you, Matt, nodding, but uh, do you want to add something uh, to Jack's points? Well, yeah, I mean, one, one thing is that uh, one of these sort of, um, I mean, I think all of, all of these efforts are essentially in some way trying to take a very, very complex thing and simplify it to as much as possible. It can't be simplified perfectly one of the one of the things that we um, one of the things that coalitions are trying to do is is help to um, basically help to clarify what uh, what people's values are and what the sort of different alignments of interests are but you know by giving people the ability to like choose different coalitions that sort of represent different kinds of of information or different kinds of interests about what is done with that information, but in a way that that still leaves quite a bit of complexity. So I'm quite uh, interested in and sort of attracted to uh, Paul Olivier's way of thinking about basically these different categories of um, of of information. Those those categories strike me as potentially good ways of um, of identifying reasonable cleavages in the space of the kind of information that people are, um, you know, uh, have interests in that could, you know, simplify the array of data coalitions that one might, you know, one might participate in. So, I mean, there's just really good thinking there. I, I, I don't know that I would, I would call it cleaving um, because, so I think like, like you guys, it feels that this process of trust is is a, a social process should become a social process if you wanted to avoid if you want to avoid overwhelming individuals so they need to be able to rely on entire processes not not entities but really a way to do things so that they can trust the systems they are using um, that includes for that excludes for instance what is currently happening where there is some big data scandal and then the the first thing journalists will do is to run to the PR entity of the company to relay the statement of the company that is completely opaque, completely unquestionable, doesn't bring any element except PR to the table and doesn't help an individual make sense of the actual situation. So I think that a core element, maybe it's due to my own background, but a core element of this social process is bring facts to the table, bring verifiability as much as possible. So that's one element. And then to, to, to maybe shift a little bit what Matt said, it's not about cleaving this space into different sectors, but it's about identifying relationships between, in your language, the different coalitions. So I couldn't help but notice that in the, very, in the, the excellent example that you picked, so it was about an individual interested in their ancestry, a family member trying to hide their ancestry. So one saw a positive impact, the other one saw a negative impact when you go a little bit broader. But then that pattern of the individual sees positive and then the larger one sees negative um, is repeated in the third and fourth step of what you describe with the genetic marker that's indicative of a disease which will help cure it but at the same time, it becomes a marker for insurance companies to affect negatively, right? So, so there is a lot of structure there. There is like in your, it was green, red, then green, red again. And then the relationship between the first two rings and the third and fourth was that you were looking at one marker for a genetic disease or a small set of markers, and then a larger set of markers for um, an entire ancestry, an entire family lineage, right? So. In, in my view, you have a coalition that might be like a family that gets becomes affiliated 
to use your own language, becomes affiliated to several markers that are present in their own genome, their own family genome. Like I have a history of this disease or I have, I have this marker in my own genome. This is a family trait and so on. So that's, that's the kind of relationship that I would seek for, within collectives to help structure precisely the, um, the, the regulatory environment. I think Timu said, so coalitions are like the abstract class and then from there you instantiate collectives and things like this. Yes, but there's also relationships between collectives that are deeply simplifying from a regulatory perspective. Thank you, Paul. Um, I see that the time is pressing up, uh, uh, so we need to start wrapping up. And uh, this is a really a fascinating topic, and especially in the context of uh, of my data, where there is interplay interplay between also individual and uh, and collective governance of, uh, of of data. So I I do hope that we can continue this discussion uh, um, soon. But before we close, um, um, what is your call to action or or wish or or, or request even? Uh, to the community. Uh, Paul, would you like to start? Yeah, so I would I would say that the my data community again, maybe due to my background, but I think the my data community needs to have a more scientific approach to the data economy. We're looking lots of entrepreneurs, lots of different actors are trying to find value in the data, the my data approach. Um, sometimes focused on economic value, sometimes of, on the public interest, so that's all great. But um, for a my data empowered individual to be able to take informed decisions, they need some form of assessment of this is this is of financial value to you, this is of collective interest, and this is how to balance the two themselves. So there is a layer of meta reflection that's needed in order for a my data empowered individual to be truly empowered. Thank you. What about uh, Jack and Matt? Uh, I don't know who wants to say first. I'll go first. I think uh, for you know people focused on policy in the community, I think what we touched on um, around like the, there are kind of some basic threshold issues that we need to um, you know get a, get across for for these coalition style institutions to. Um, become, you know, real novel organizations. So things like rights delegation. Um, I think that the whole um, category of kind of existing trust law is an interesting space where um, it's like a very nice um, piece of law that flexibly manages many types of rights, provides kind of protections institutionally for, um, uh, you know, accountable fiduciary duties and so forth. Um, I would also love to see, you know, more public funding behind these initiatives to, um, you know, both uh, kickstart them and, and also scale them up. I think it would be great to see um, my data operators, data coalitions, government agencies start to use some of these privacy enhancing technologies as well um, in, in early experiments with, um, you know, careful sharing of, of uh, data that can be used for, um, you know, some research and, and other insights. And then there's also just more broadly, like the, a huge research agenda that we're just um, beginning to articulate and grow a network around solving important open questions around governance and technology and regulation and how it all fits together. Thank you, Jack. What about Matthew? Uh, I think very quickly, my I think my call to action would be to, um, to sort of uh, start beginning open up to a shift in language in conversations with the public and with uh and with like lawmakers away from the language of individual rights i i think that it's not because there's anything wrong with individual rights it's just because as a conceptual tool uh that there are limitations i think to uh to that uh, to that approach in in its ability to um uh to substantiate institutions that enable the right kinds of, of collective decisions to, um, to, to, to be made. So I think there, there's just a, there's a, um, an unusual, somewhat unprecedented sort of conversation that, that needs to, to happen. And I sometimes worry that the, the language of individual rights uh, is an obstacle to that, to that conversation. 
Definitely, the language is very important to even frame our, our, our thinking. So thank you for, uh, for that call to action. Thank you both, uh, um, Polly, Matthew, and, and, and Jack. Um, as mentioned, I hope that we can continue this discussion uh, of uh, my data conference, uh, maybe in the follow up uh, um, events, uh, and uh, of course, the synchronously in between. And I encourage all of the participants in the audience also to get in touch to, to learn, uh, learn more and, uh, and see what experiments can be done uh, together. Um, so uh, we take now uh, a, a around 10 minute break um, and then we start with our last session of uh, today which actually uh, really complements uh, this session also uh, very well. So do stay tuned and uh, we'll see you in a bit. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.